having a lot of fun. Ashton's first experiments was the Levitin that we use there, uh, and uh, the gravity of the things that we gather from it. So if you look at the uh, configuration of it, obviously these are very simple. It's just two of our points uh, that we use as focus for high visual projectors to a very sharp uh, spot. And uh, the uh, presentation of those top of the pieces is a balance between two forces. The first force is the gradient force that pulls the pieces in. The second force is the scattering force. dominate over the scattering force that gets the uh, traction. Uh, if you want to uh, extend this to air, it's not so simple. First of all, you have one problem with this. We're using this for things that are very short, hundreds of microns, and that's not very good either. Uh, in fact, in Ashton's first experiment, he levitated against uh, gravity and, and could do that just with one lens. But the gravity compensated for the scattering force, which is just left with the gradient force. It's not the most convenient configuration, however, because uh, then you're locked in very particular laser power that will exactly levitate you out of these things. Uh, so uh, if you think about building an experiment, I, and I want to talk a little bit about some of the practical aspects of jumping into this game and, and building up a new system, uh, we realized that uh, it would be that much better to uh, get a, a large working distance, and so I need to get the beam far away from everything, and, and also uh, compensate for this uh, scattering in the optics of a microscope objective, nevertheless, you can get stable tracking of small particles. Uh, the next problem that we had to solve was how do you introduce the particle uh, to the traffic in the first place. In water, it's very easy because it's just flowing. In air, somehow you have to uh, break the van der Waals bond. And we start out with this uh, little microsphere that we can purchase from Bank's laboratory that they are uniform to a remarkable degree look like dust and you place them on a substrate and somehow you have to get them off the substrate and it turns out the largest force around is the van der Waals force. And because it scales like one of our squares, the acceleration scales like one of our squares, in practice uh, we could only launch these down to about one micrometer per span. And if you do it this way, the wholesale uh, or the CPO effort for the atomic generator all works. We can trap microspheres in air. So the configuration of Ashton in 1970 and 71 was the is that your uh, lens looks quite dirty after a while. So that's not a good choice. And as I said,
said also it limits you to very specific laser instruments. So you said we're going to take these movies and create them from scratch. And if you have independent control over the machine, you can do that. And aren't there different types of control that you can do with something that you can do with the machine that you're not microchipping it and then do with the machine? You might ask, how do we detect the motion of the bead? Well, the bead, as it moves in the tweezer, is scattering light. And if you look in the forward direction, you can actually see the deflection, the track deflection of the laser beam as it is moving. So this is typically done with a quadrant detector. Quadrant detectors are commercially available. They are split photodiodes that take different control terms, such as six and a half, which are some of the tabs that take the different control terms that you mentioned for motion. The problem with commercially available quadrant detectors is typically they're very slow. They have large areas, hence large capacitance. And so the bandwidths are in the hundreds of kilohertz range, typically. Now, maybe up to one megahertz. So one of the things I realized early on is that we needed much faster position-sensitive detectors. And to do this, we used a simple trick, which surprisingly hadn't been done before, is we separated the two functions of a quadrant detector. Those two functions are splitting the wave front of the light and photo detection. But you don't have to do them on the same onboard, the same chip. That's what the quadrant detector does for you. But because it has large area, it's slow. So we separated the two functions. We used a multi, the first generation, a multi-mode fiber bundle to split the wave front and then fed the two outputs into very fast photo detectors. In the second generation, we just used a mirror that's precisely cut at an angle and split the wave front that way. But doing this simple trick, we were able to speed up the performance and the time resolution of this detector by about a factor of 1,000. So now we can get down to the tens of nanoseconds. That means we have to go faster. We could go to the hundreds of picoseconds if we need to. So we're not inherently limited by the speed, of course, of signal coming out of these scattered beads and detectors. We can also observe the scattered light in the camera if we go to monitor it. So this is an early version, very simple chamber compared to the other things that we're doing. I think this is simple compared to the kind of heroic effort that we can make in different occasions and what we get. So it was kind of fun to just have this simple experiment where we didn't need any precise locking of lasers or top speed. And this Pratt Adams, Pratt and Reed and Glass for a long time did that kind of thing. They did this for many, many hours of research and put it on the air. And we could look at the spectrum. And the first question you might ask is, for example, if you see we have those two outbound beads that are deflecting the light in the air, if you take at low pressures at one millicore, you get large emission, like 1,000. That's a lower limit. And the machine is limited by the jitter in our laser power because the frequency of oscillation changes as the laser power changes. And that's something we will address in the future. But one of the appealing features of this system is, in fact, a bead in vacuum is essentially decoupled from the environment. It's not a clamped oscillator. So there is not an obvious limit to the cube. That's why you have to be able to characterize that. And the cube may be extremely high in this case. The other nice feature about such a system is that we can turn off at some point the oscillator completely just by extinguishing the light, letting the bead undergo free fall, just like the kind of Millikan oil drop experiment. You have to completely turn the charge on the bead as well to let it move and give it free fall. So that just shows the power spectra of trapped microspheres at different pressures and what you see that the bandwidth is going down as a function of pressure. And we reach a final pressure where we are limited only by laser noise. And the first future improvements of two megahertz will require very, very stable laser noise. So this is the – so this is a – back – this started up about two years – like about 50 years ago. And we thought that maybe as a first interesting goal would be to revisit a very old problem in physics, and that is ground and motion, but with much higher resolution. So, of course, you know we all know about ground and motion, the current demanded motion of a particle in a liquid-like gas, discovered in 1927. The really benchmark theory since 1905, now the Einstein machine, developed ground and motion kinetic theory, which was confirmed by Jean Talens in 1969. And the key 
to the concept of the instantaneous velocity of a rounded particle. And if we can get into this regime, a very short time scale, then velocity has a measure that can be the velocity. Uh, that the RMS velocity that, that corresponds to a cubic glass in the uh, air at the temperature is 0.4 millimeters per second. Now, what that says, if we want to measure this, Remember, uh, we are looking at a bead of glass that has a diameter of a few microns, three microns, yet the regime to resolve just the center of mass of that bead to In air, which is uh, somewhat easier, uh, at one atmosphere, the time will be five microseconds and point two microns. So that's still uh, too anxious for the atomic scale resolution of the motion of heat. Uh, but if we can do that, then we might be able to very fundamental predictions of the planet and energy at the center of the universe is all and, and that is that one half is being in the square to one half of the And then, and as I said, earlier attempts uh, were not consistent with this expectation of the uh, and subsequent attempts also did not resolve it. And in fact, back to Einstein's paper from 1907. Einstein, uh, in particular, was interested in the question of the instantaneous velocity of ground motion and, and, and the theoretical operations on the ground motion. Uh, he analyzed the time scale for observing this instantaneous velocity, and he made a prediction, which was dangerous for theorists to do. He said that the experiment is impossible.
certainly could, could raise that frequency, lower that frequency in those longer times. But we weren't really interested. There, there have been so many studies of, of diffusion that, that that was not a novel feature. I'm asking you to take the Because we're primarily interested in going to the short time. We, we, have, we have taken data at lower, I, I'm just not showing the details here. But uh, th there was nothing new about that. Yeah. No, and we have done. We've gone to lower trap frequency. Yeah, we've, we've done that, and, and, and we can make the trap frequency lower and lower, sure, until eventually the heat falls out of the trap. Uh, so, in this case, uh, we, we do get to the uh, atmospheric pressure, which is a combination of many things. We have lower pressures, uh, which in a sense make us even longer. time measures, there's no average on this. To get the velocity that we need, uh, we have to average somewhat to reduce the noise, and, but nevertheless we can map out the real time the velocity. Uh, this is, to our knowledge, the first direct measurement of the instantaneous velocity of a grounding particle. And now we can, uh, are in a position to uh, test the exoplanetary theorem for grounding motion, and we measure surprised how, how people got upset by that. I mean, there were comments, how dare you say that? Or, you know, it's like uh, saying something bad about Einstein. I would not say that we proved it wrong, but we proved him right. Uh, but uh, the question is, where does one go with this? say that coming from quantum optics, doing an experiment with water like, uh, runs against the strength of the but, but, but on the other hand, my chemist friends tell me we must do this experiment. So, so I'm going to break my rule and you know, break down and maybe uh, have an undergraduate. I'm not, I'm not also sure where this is going, but, but we are in a, in a unique position that we can look on, on communication fluid on a time scale that we've never been observed before. So, now, there are some First experiment that we that is will soon be published. We report uh, in water that we could uh, that we could see the beginning of ballistic motion, but at that time we did not have the resolution to really see the instantaneous velocity. We have now made some improvements, uh, which I believe will allow us in maybe in the next month or so to measure the instantaneous velocity in, in water and then possibly in other fluids. Uh, this requires some. Uh, from interferometry using uh, what we know from quantum optics, bring, bringing that to bear, and, and also some improvement in the super detector. I think we will get to this resolution in the near future. Uh, this will be a uh, worthwhile search for a possible breakdown of the exoplanetary theory, uh, which is, I doubt, in water, but it, it's worth looking, uh, especially worth looking in complex fluids where there could be uh, coexisting. The other possible direction would maybe to study uh, non-equilibrium. Deviation from from the real time uh, velocity from natural motion. 
I agree. I agree. But no one is looking at your data. So you could say, you know, you could take the attitude that if you believe it and therefore we don't look, or we look and we agree. I think everyone would be happy if we just. Well, there has been some theory. There actually has been some theoretical work that predicts on if there's complex fluids, not really not in water, but where there might be because of different correlation lengths and different that different. Yeah. 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 Well, I don't I don't I don't have a good answer for that, except that we are going to measure this. And 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 and, you know, again, I'm taking a very experimental attitude towards this, that it's not something hard for us to do at this point once we once we can do it. And if we can see any any it may not be in the exposition system itself, exposition theorem itself, but it may just be in in the velocity velocity correlation function. That is something we can measure that hasn't been measured. So, again, this is something that we can do. We will do. But the coming back to I think what what is more in line with this workshop is to go the opposite direction. Instead of going to water, let's go to vacuum. And think about moving the system towards the quantum level. To do that, we first of all, we have to pump out some gas and have to implement some method of feedback control. Now, in the long term, we might think of some more complicated methods such as feedback, such as capture cooling. Certainly there's some theoretical work done both by a number of groups, Peter Zoller and his group. We did some theoretical analysis of this problem of capture cooling and heat. And there's now two serotic groups likewise. We, in fact, started the experiment also independently of that and just, again, said let's start with what we know how to do. In the analysis of capture cooling, I think one of the assumptions was that one was in the Rayleigh scattering regime where the size of the bead was small compared to the period of the standing wave. So that kind of required a 100 nanometer or so diameter bead. We have not yet figured out how to do that in practice. So we know how to launch and trap beads that are up as small a size, one micrometer, and we have not figured out how to go lower. And I know of several. I've heard sort of people using it. There's several people that have tried and also experienced similar difficulties. So perhaps if someone can figure out how to do that, that would be advantageous. But for now, we're just taking an operational approach. These are the beads that we can trap, and we are going to see how far we can go by cooling them. Our starting point is at room temperature. So there's no cryogenic in this experiment. It's a room temperature apparatus. And we start from Peter and myself and Mr. Wilson. Now, initially, we tried at the first attempt, we tried to correct for the motion. So we had to, first of all, implement a position sensor detection not just in one dimension but in all three dimensions because we wanted to achieve 3D cooling, which is also kind of a unique feature of this system. Initially, we tried displacing the beams with a Kutsoff modulator. So actually, once we detected its position, we displaced the beams to reduce the trap and to compensate for that. And although we cooled somewhat, we got from 300 Kelvin to about 10 Kelvin. I decided not to publish it because there was too much coupling that sound between the degrees of freedom. And that's something for the experimentalists in the audience. It's important to note that a Kutsoff with modulators, when you think you're scanning in one dimension, you are also scanning in the other, although you might not realize it. And it has to do with, I think, acoustic waves. And as they bounce around the Kutsoff crystal, they are not simple one-dimensional waves. The ultimate solution, which has proven to be the best so far, has been to introduce auxiliary independent beams, which are green beams that are cushion cooled. And we have one beam for each degree of freedom. And we then apply this independently. So the three degrees are in the feedback mode. The experiment, meanwhile, has gotten a little more complicated. It tends to grow. You know, it can start out simple and keep building. But, again, it's manageable. And these are our latest results. This focuses on 
go in terms of love of the truth as possible. And we know that we have certain coupling between the degrees of freedom, and we know where they're coming from. So it's a matter of the next generation of correcting that. We won't bore you with details, but we think we can eliminate. First of all, it would be nice to bring all the degrees of freedom down to the same temperature and go much lower. How low can it go? Uh, I'm not sure yet. I, I, I think it's fair to say with this cold damping, I don't, we cannot reach ground state cooling. But I think we can reach close. And the question is, what can we do if we can get close to the ground state? And how close? I'm not sure of all the applications, but we were starting to think of, of what would be worthwhile doing. And uh, one of them is uh, to actually allude to by, by putting a, a measurement. Uh, you could imagine, for example, charging up the beat. It's not hard to spray some charge on it. And then using it as a local thermometer. So imagine that we can cool it uh, uh, down to close to the ground state. And we can place it in the vicinity of ch other charged particles, like par particles that we otherwise could not cool easily, and we cannot even measure their temperature. For example, we have a collection of antiprotons in a trap, and that relates to another project that I'm working on with Klaus Blaum in Heidelberg, in fact, to use our methods for, for that purpose. But we were thinking about, could we possibly use uh, a charged bead that we cool at, as a thermometer, first of all, by just seeing the heating rate uh, as it's undergoing collisions with background trapped uh, charged particles, which won't actually reach the heat. And, and ultimately, if you could measure real-time heating, then you might be able to do stochastic cooling by feeding back on the trap. So this might be a new way of, of cooling particles. You could also imagine, perhaps, in, in thinking if you had a magnetic particle, you might be able to see the interaction with neutrons. Okay. I don't know. This is speculative. These are workshops, so I'm allowed to say it, even though it's going to be recorded. Uh, so I, I, from my perspective, I, I am intrigued by the idea of using uh, the bead as a sensor. Uh, at some level, it, it could be a sensor of just the light power, because uh, as the uh, as the power of the laser changes, the speed oscillation frequency changes, and we're thinking of actually using that in a feedback mode to control the power of light, which could be useful for other applications where you need to stabilize, for example, uh, current methods of stabilizing light intensity using conventional noise meters are using photo detection, which are very good for longer time scales, but not very good for short time scales. I mean, for they're good on short time scales, but not the longer time scales where you get drips, you get 60 hertz noise, and it's very hard to control uh, the long-term drift of a laser. And for certain applications, that could be useful. Um, there have been predictions. Uh, not sure this audience, but Andrew Sirachi and uh, John Kitchen both are proposing to tell us that we can use the surface of the sun and gravity forces. for me to assess that. I think it's a hard experiment. Uh, and one has to really be concerned about shielding passenger force. Does everyone see that? I don't know. I'm talking with no uh, data. So Mr. Rashi is now sitting on his computer. So he's not able to see the movement. But uh, it, it, uh, it's intriguing to think about uh, quantum systems for living organisms. Uh, I'm not sure how much we will pursue that. More, more generally, of course, this paper similar to the Baller et al. paper, uh, was concerned with ground state cooling. Uh, and, and that, as a, uh, as, a, as a starting point for creating the position states of the coordinate laws of all relative temperature to this, uh, is really the interesting question of, of how now heat appears in all these uh, coordinate uh, positions. And uh, maybe our system uh, might be able to test different 
experiment, one could potentially go to very long time scales, and thus uh, just decouple it and turn it off and reload and so forth. I'd like to end by, by just saying that Arthur was very happy to see uh, that the optical seizure is finding new directions in physics despite that it's over 40 years old. So I'd like to end here and acknowledge all the other members of my group that, that are working on other projects, uh, one project out of many in this group. And thank you for your time. Well, for, for it, if we want to do ground state cooling, that's one, one reason to get away from vibrational technical noise. And, 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 and the higher frequency we can get, the better from that standpoint. Well, but, you know, I, but you can't, uh, you, you can't cool faster than the oscillation point. You're limited in doing that. You don't want to be, the, uh, be limited by the trap oscillation system. So the, the particle is not moving on. Yeah. Well, you have to. Uh, well, you still, yeah. Yeah. Well, we thought, we, yeah, we, we thought about using, uh, you, s you still need to measure a way to measure and feed back. And those op optically, that seems the best way. Uh, it's, it's possible. Um, I mean, one, one thing we worry about a little bit is just the stability of the charge to mass ratio. It's not, it's not a fundamental quantity like it is for an ion. Uh, and, and if that changes, and, and we, we've seen actually, we have charged it up see charge on the beat because we actually what I didn't mention is we actually tried to do feedback using um, uh, electric field on, on a charged beat <coughs> and so we played with that a little bit and we found that it just wasn't stable enough in time so that's another reason but you're right may, maybe in, in, in a long term sense maybe a pulse trap would be good I, I, I'm a little worried I'm not sure how to, how to interpret you know pulse trap there is RF heating when you're displaced from the center of the trap now here size of the bead is big, so what does that correspond to? What, what, what would that do in terms of, of the effective harmonic potential? I'm not sure. I mean, I, you know, I love ion traps. I, I, my, my work with David Wyman was on linear ion traps, so I would be very natural to think about ion traps. I'm, I'm just not sure that they're right.
that, but we, we find, though, that we're 